Welcome to Mershman Seed's Cup of Joe. On this episode, soil conditions are fluctuating with the weather, but farmers are eager to plant. Hear about what farmers are going to fight in different conditions and weather. We explain the components of our seed treatment and how they work together to help the seed grow at a more even, faster style of emergence from the ground. Joe talks about what could go wrong before planting and how to manage those risks. If you're a farmer in Iowa, Ben recommends checking out the Iowa State University Soil Moisture Network to monitor moisture levels in soil in your area. Hi, this is Joe Mershman. Welcome to Mershman Seeds Cup of Joe. Today we have our regulars. We have Turk and Ben. Ben, lots of things going on right now. It's cold and wet in some areas. It's cold and dry in others. Farmers are saying, I want to go plant. So let's talk about that. Yeah. So basically where we're at is, uh, let's call it, draw the line, uh, probably on that Interstate 70-ish. We have uh, soil temps north of there are running in the mid to lower, well, mid 40s to lower 50s. And we're going to see some weather coming over uh, Saturday night, Sunday uh, in that you know 30 degree range so it's going to pull soil temps back down um, uh, that's north of interstate 70 as you get south of interstate 70 we're running into you know wet conditions and uh, then you got your east west map west of the mississippi we have a tendency to get drier east of the mississippi you have a tendency to get uh, pretty wet and uh, there's a kind of a mixing of, of all that that's going on so we kind of wanted to just talk about um, what are the things we're going to fight in each one of those conditions? And uh, so let's go to Nebraska, north of the Iowa border. Um, they are in a little bit drier temp, or they're in a little bit drier field condition right now. And uh, but they're they're sitting at a cooler soil temp. So what risks do we run when we are in a cool, dry spell? We have a tendency to uh, be able to get the crop in the ground but uh, germination isn't gonna happen very quickly. So that seed's gonna imbibe the water. Um, I think there's enough moisture for the uh, imbibing process to happen because everybody's gotten quarter inch, half inch, three quarters of an inch of rain in the past, you know, two weeks probably. Mm -hmm. So that seed's gonna imbibe that water, but it's gonna sit right where it's at. So it can imbibe the water. It's probably not gonna kill it. The soil temps aren't quite that cold, but a soybean seedling is going to sit at that point which when a soybean seedling sits, it sets itself up for uh, infection to occur, different uh, diseases, and uh, it, it's, it's just not super conducive for even emergence and uh, getting healthy plant stand started right off the bat. Also insects, right? Yep, yep, we are at this threshold now where seed corn maggot, um, wire worms, we're gonna start seeing insect pressure start to kick in. Uh, soybean cyst nematode is something else that is in that mix there where uh, all of that, the longer period of time that that plant kind of sits in idle mode on a soybean plant, the more time it has to be susceptible to uh, the different uh, pests and pathogens that, that are gonna affect it. So seed treatment rates become very critical when you plant early. Yep. In other words, you've got to have the staying power. And the, some of the companies out there just put the basic on, which if it's a contact, as soon as that seed cracks, there's no protection. If it's systemic, it will hang around, depending upon the rate. Now, our seed treatment, uh, Mershman's Bonus Coated Plus, we can hang around for 20 to 25 days. In other words, we put, it, we put higher rates, it costs more, but when you get into situations like this, it's gonna give you the ability for the seed to not rot. Now, however, when it comes to insecticide, uh, the imidacloprin that we put on, keep in mind that these products, all these neonics, and you can explain it better than I can, Ben, they do not kill the wireworm or the seed corn maggot. They kind of put them in sleep mode, right? You want to explain a little bit about that? Yeah, so so the, the, the popular product, the name for the imidacloprid is uh, gaucho, and there isn't a high enough rate of gaucho that you can use uh, to kill wireworms or, or necessarily seed corn maggot, but what, the, what happens is they imbibe that, that protein and 
it gets into the gut of the the insect and it will basically just pull the metabolism of that insect way down to the point where it gets sleepy and they basically go dormant for a long enough period that it gives the plant uh, an extended period of time to put on a root system, not live off of the energy that is in the seed itself and, you know, be able to develop so that if there is more feeding, it isn't a critical situation for that seed to survive. Most of the time, by the time they come back to life, it's warm temperatures for wireworms. The wireworms will push further down into the ground for seed corn maggots. I'd have to look, but I think we have a pretty good efficacy with imidacloprid on controlling, uh, controlling the seed corn maggot side of things. So other things that can set up too when you plant early, um, uh, you, that's when you need a product like Sultrol um, to protect yourself from sudden death because sudden death is a cool disease too, favors cool conditions, slower emergence. And of course, if you're using a Levo and you're using um, one of the uh, bleacher type products. PPOs. PPOs, I said, it, said that wrong. That's why we keep Ben here for to <laughs> keep me straight. But uh, there's an interaction there and you get that halo effect, you get that burning, which even slows the bean down even more. But the infection on sudden death uh, syndrome of, occurs as the beans coming out of the ground in a crick stage. Yep. So those are all things, you know, like I, before we started this program, I said we need to tell farmers what can go wrong so they can manage that risk. And there's ways to manage things like that, but it costs money, okay? And so everything that a farmer does, and, and you know, if we could just farm a year behind, in other words, if we knew what was happening, farming would be a lot easier, but unfortunately we don't. So uh, anyhow, those are things that worry me when you plant early and uh, and it is very critical that you get that perfect stand because if you don't get a perfect stand you're behind the eight ball for yield potential right off the bat and i know we're seeing a tendency right now for farmers to want to plant beans first because of the fact that they believe that you know the uniform corn emergence they know there's a correlation but we also believe there's a correlation between a uniform bean emergence too. Now, I don't think the penalty as much as it is on corn, but there is a correlation. And then that brings us to the Trepidity ST, which is a, uh, a product that reduces stress. And you might talk about how, how that helps you in these situations, and that's standard on RC treatment also. Yep, so Trepidity ST is a combination of two individual products but those two products make up about three different main classifications. There are uh, nutritionals that are in the Trepidity ST, so there are some macro and micronutrients that um, are wrapped around that seed, and that's the nutrition that a seedling needs to help itself uh, essentially kickstart germination. So it's the it's 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 macro and micronutrients in small small amounts that that get that seed what it, exactly what it needs wrapped around it to to push it out of the ground so there's the nutritional portion of it there is the hormone uh, portion of it so it is it's wrapping all of the hormones around the seed that a seed will naturally produce when it's under stress and when those hormones uh, are already there it's again like a kickstarter that that it's the cytokinins that the that plant will push to, to get itself out of the ground because it, it thinks that it's already under stress, but it's not necessarily under stress. So we're those two things, and you're gonna hear a, a common term here is we're gonna get our Kickstarter from our third portion of things, which is amino acid, which is key for um, pr that plant for producing energy. So amino acids are the building blocks of creating glucose and sugars in the plant. And those three things in the correct combination and the correct ratios wrapped around the seed, um, in conjunction with the fungicide and insecticides help that plant push itself out of the ground in a more even uh, faster style of emergence. So the biostimulants mitigate stress and, and we got one of the best ones on the market. I mean it's and, and it's not cheap. It's a very expensive product to put on but it really pays dividends when you have any type of emergent stress you know so and we've seen with our flag tests when we follow those plants that emerge first they typically have more pods on them and more nodes. Yep. So that's why we put it on because at the end of the day, we want to reduce the amount of risks that a farmer has. In other words, I hate replant, absolutely hate it. 
because we offer free replant. So I'm in the same boat as a farmer. I want to do everything I can to our seed to get the best quality seed and the best seed treatment to get that stand because um, I, I, I am invested in your crop just like you are. In other words, if you don't get a stand, uh, you got to start over. And guess what? You know, we're backing it with free replant. So we're on, in the, on the same side. So our goal with our show like the Cup of Joe is to give you as much information as we possibly can so that you can manage and decide what level of risk you want to take out there. Yep. So when we, we talked about the uh, Nebraska and yep. the conditions out there, it kind of just transitions right across Iowa and then we get east of the Mississippi and we're going to go in the other way with the, the wetter situation over there. Um, what's the what's the difference yep so as we get into the wetter it's more of a mechanical issue at that point and it is pushing the bubble on getting in fields that are too wet and we're going to see compaction issues that are going to be there for the entire life of the plant you're going to see smearing issues from opening discs that are going to impact the uh, the root structure of that plant all year long i'm going to say that that's going to affect corn with the, the size of the root system that a corn plant has, more so than beans, but still to that same effect, you don't want to be mudding either one of those products in because it's gonna affect how well the, the furrow closes around the, the, the seed placement itself because if it's too wet and you're not getting that perfect closure, that perfect bed for that seed to be sitting in, you're not gonna get the correct amount of seed to soil contact. You're gonna be extremely dependent on more rain to get those products to sprout. Um, there's just a whole mess of uh, thou shall nots, and that's kind of what we're, what sparked that article is uh, the farm journals was the Ten Commandments of, of, of what to avoid during the spring. But it, that, that seed trench is so important when it comes to corn and soybean uh, emergence that everything that we just talk about with the trepidity and um, the different diseases and in, insects, that's all out the window if you can't get that uh, seed bed pressed around the... Uh, the seed in a perfect manner to get the un uh, uniform amount of moisture and heat and temperature in that that bed to get that crop out of the ground. And and there's another underlying issue out there too in the industry, and that is our soybean seed quality this year is not quite as good as it was last year. So in other words, you know, normally we like to see our germinations mid 90s and on up. You know, and we're not seeing it. We're probably seeing about eight, seven, eight. 9% less germination this year. So that's another thing that's coming into play too with, uh, and it sometimes does, sometimes doesn't, but we, we're not seeing the seed quality that we would we saw last year is what I'm saying. So it's a little sub note. It's not something I'd worry about. I mean, we're, we're doing, there's a lot of bins we didn't use because of uh, germination issues. And, but um, just in general, I would say that there's been, there's some problems uh, out there, so be alert to that. Alert to that too. And I know that a lot of farmers think, well, if I plant early, I'll just increase my population, just push my population, and I'll push through it. The reality of it is, if you've got really really bad conditions to plant in, you just have more dead plants. In other words, there's no correlation that if I plant um, a huge percentage of more seeds, that I'll automatically get a better stand. If you have disease, it affects every seedling the same, every plant the same. So the, the old saying is, you know, you just have more dead plants. Uh, so weather conditions influence all these things. The conditions at planting time, the soil conditions at planting time it is the most important thing, period. Always has been, always will be. So make sure that you're going into good conditions. Pushing early is less than ideal. You know, two wets, less than ideal. So, and I've, you've probably heard me say more than once, it's too early to start mudding things in right now. We've got that, but 60 days to get the job done. And, and of that 60 days, there's probably, what, a 30-day 30, 30 in, window in the middle, 15 days early is, is maybe not ideal, 15 days, the last 15 days is not ideal, but that 30 days in the middle, you can, you're gonna maximize yield if you get them get everything planted in uniform soil conditions and get that even emergence and get that plant off and, and running. I mean, it's, it's, it's just 
let's think about this year a little bit too. Uh, in most of our growing areas, we had a wonderful November and December, and we got our fertilizer on, we got our fall tillage done, uh, we've got we've got terraces worked on, we got tiling put in. I mean, we had the, one of the nicest falls, extended falls that we've ever seen for getting field work done. So a lot of the things that the farmer's worried about right now, he's already got done. So he's really basically just got the planter to get out there and go. But that's part of the problem, Joe, was I don't have anything else to do. Right, let's go plant. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I know. And what I'm seeing right now, though, Turk, is I'm seeing a lot of fields turn green. Mm -hmm. And w when they turn green, you know, from the winter annuals, what, what, what buddy likes to come in and land on a green flush field uh, for corn? Yeah. Uh, uh, army worms, black yeah. cutworms. Yeah. And we're seeing some already. Yep. Yep. Uh, there's two different counties, Tama and Washington County, that are reporting uh, that they've already seen sightings. So, so the pre emerged herbicides, keep getting rid of those winter annuals. Mm, that should be the focus. It really hasn't been too conducive to go spray any pre emerges herbicides with the wind. I mean, it seems like the wind's been blowing for 30 days. And so, I mean, that's one thing that I haven't seen in the field anywhere to speak of is a sprayer. Yeah. Because, you know, early in the week this week, I seen, I was up and down Interstate 80, and, you know, there was all. In all stages of field work being done, I see notes being planted, I see anhydrous going on, to, uh, uh, field cultivators running, knocking down corn stalks or whatever. There was, it, it, was, it was pretty ideal except for 30, 30 and 40 mile an hour winds and, uh, and 50 mile an hour winds in, in places. So uh, there is, there's, there's not much herbicide being put down, but it's important to make sure that you do plant into uh, a clean field, if at all possible. And I know there's a lot of, also there's a lot of uh, uh, cover crops out there that have to be dealt with at some point. And then I know they're saying, go ahead and plant into those cover crops and then terminate them afterwards. That seems to be the name of the game. But you know, if there's weeds out there, the bigger those weeds get, the harder it is to kill them. And that's gonna be our issue that I think we're gonna fight this year, all year, is making sure that you can kill those weeds with the first time with a limited amount of herbicide available to get the job done. So those are all important things that do not do not screw up and and get the the uh, get don't lose sight of what is the most important thing. And that's a clean field planted in the right conditions. We think we have it bad, but the farmers up in North Dakota, central yeah. North Dakota, had 30 inches of snow. I saw some of the videos, and you know the farmers are just—they don't even know if they're going to farm this year. They're so depressed right now. So it's not a time to be depressed. Uh, we're we're pretty fortunate right now, in, at least in most of our marketing trade area. That went right across uh, um, Minnesota and into Wisconsin too. That that snow, so really below normal, much below normals there, but pretty much below normal everywhere, but much below normal in, in that northern uh, three tiers of states there. Well, the key thing too is when you put your seed in the ground, the worst thing that can happen to you is to have that imbibe the water is cold. In other words, you get a cold rain and then that seed swells with that cold water. That is a recipe for a disaster. And I don't care if it's in April or if it's early May. We, last year, the, the bad time to plant in this local area was the first week of May, which is normally the perfect time to plant. And we had a lot of cornfields that had to be replanted. Yep. So, I don't know, this farming thing is, is not easy. I mean, it's not easy. And, and you have to manage those risks with the, with the, the resources that you have available. And, and this year with limited resources, when I say limited resources, the availability to get additional product to do it again is going to be, when it comes to herbicides and everything else, is going to be very, very uh, important to be able to make sure that it gets done right. And what I'm seeing is, is that that perfect planning is going to be compounded by the inability to get perfect spraying done because once that seed goes in the ground, there's a, there's a window that needs to be sprayed, and we're gonna start getting in trouble there too, I fear, 
once this temperature turns around the last week of April, which is when the 21st is what we talked about here a long time ago, and it still looks like the, the forecast is going to make a dramatic change in, in uh, temperatures about that week, and then we're going to be off to the races yeah, still, for still, everything. Still forecasting above average temperatures in May and June and July and August. So do it right. Get it done right because you know, when you don't have a good root system because you didn't get put in right to start with, it's going to make a big difference in those dry, those warm, dry months. Reiterate how important it is to plant that deep corn at two inches deep. Mm -hmm. Talk about that. Yeah. That planting depth is so critical on early planting or at any time. Corn, it's very critical all the time. But even on early planted soybeans, you have to get that stuff in the ground two inches uh, just to get it out of the variability of the day and nighttime temperature swings because plant it too shallow and, the, and we have 50 mile an hour warm winds, it's going to dry out and, and you may not get it out of the ground. So you got to get it down there in that two inches where it's got a more stable soil temperature and uh, it'll get out of the ground quicker at two inches than it will at an inch in warm windy w conditions. Good point. Ben, do you have anything else that you want to add today? No. Nope. I Turk? think it's, it's been busy. Yeah. I just I was just going to talk about the, the markets and, and the, the drought forecast. Uh, I mean, they, we had an updated forecast, and we really didn't see, even with the rains that have come through, we didn't really see any improvement in drought index at all. Uh, you know, some there were some areas that were got just slightly worse, but uh, overall, this drought's not going away. It's you know, we get west of the, of the Missouri River, and it's it's severe, and uh, you know the parts across Iowa that are still in drought conditions, and so it's it's not going away. I mean, it's really this tale of of two completely different growing regions. You got the wet, and you got the dry, and you know the people in the middle are kind of halfway between, which is what Iowa is right now, and uh, so. One of the things to be watching for that I learned at the ICM conference is a tool that uh, Iowa State has, and I can link it to it so that we have that model available, but it is the subsoil uh, moisture index, mm -hmm. and you can go in and plug it into your specific county or your region. I think they either break up Iowa by eight different regions or nine different regions, and you look at, at your area, and the one of the things that Dr. Satorius talks about is that that when you talk about drought monitoring is that you never want those moisture levels especially as we get into june july and august you never want those moisture readings to drop below where 2012 was because they think that the difference between 2021 and 2012 was about this much rain this much just in time rain mm -hmm. so those are things to be tracking now as where you are on your subsoil moisture compared to 2012 and if we're tracking ahead of that point or behind that point because we survived with above average yields last year but we were living by the skin on our teeth yeah and if you're not familiar with what ben's talking about in iowa they put a network of uh, of uh, soil moisture uh, in, uh, sensors in all the different areas that, and it well, goes down to what, six feet or five, at six feet? At least four. At least four. So we basically know how much gas is in our tank at any given time, which the idea with Iowa State was, well, we can predict yield potential if we know how much gas is in the tank and water. And um, so they put the system in, and we have one here in West Point that, that Mershman Seeds sponsored. Uh, so we have one here in Southeast Iowa, but um, it's a very good system. And they're learning more and more about, you know, you know, when it's hot and dry in July, you know, should you be selling corn or cold off selling corn? Now, if you know how much moisture is in subsoil moisture you have, they are working on predictive models of what that corn yield potential could be then. Yep. Even without rain. Correct. So it's a pretty cool system. Well, anything else, Stuart? Speaking of selling corn, okay, basis is uh, is down to almost zero in places now on corn, and that's telling me that the uh, that the uh, people that need corn are getting it bought because they're bidding up for it right now. So I'll say again, if you still got corn in the bin, it's a good time to 
let them have it because with basis being zero or and it's not positive yet. I haven't seen a positive one yet, but it's it's headed that way. It was it was pretty wide basis not that long ago. Now it's going the other way. So corn is corn is making new highs. Beans are dragging along, and uh, I, I just again do not miss the opportunity. Keep an eye on it. What did you think of uh, Lynn's corny joke last week? The whole I thought, one. I thought Lynn's corny joke was really good. I thought I thought he he held up. I, I, if anybody doesn't know, I wasn't here last week, and I, I want to first of all I want to I want to squell the rumor that the name of the show is going for, from Cup of Joe to Breakfast with Ben. Okay, <laughs> I'm, that's not going to happen. But if I missed maybe two times, that might happen. But uh, right now it's still Cup of Joe. But anyhow, that was. Uh, Internally here, that was the discussion, and so I had to, that, that was funny. <laughs> but a good idea, so not a bad idea. So here's the corny jokes. Um, you know, right now the grass is all green, mowers are starting to come out, you know. Uh, so I thought, I, well, let's do some lawn jokes, you know. What do you call a chicken-proof lawn? What do you call a chicken-proof lawn? Impeccable, impeccable, okay. That's just a warm-up, okay. okay. Right. This is a better one. You know, we talked about drought, right? Okay. What did one blade of grass say to another about the lack of rain? I guess we'll just have to make do. D E W. Uh huh. Okay. Yep. <laughs> that's a little bit funny. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> All right. That's okay. All right. Well, thank you for watching today. We hope your family is healthy and safe. And uh, we'll get this weather. We'll turn around. Our, our long range predictors are saying May's going to be warm. So it's going to be a busy time. Get your rest. Uh, we're going to be hitting pretty quick here. So thank you. We'll see you next week. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Happy Easter.